Hi, everyone. It's a good day when I remember to turn off my music. Um, welcome. I'm Dorothea. I'm one of the owners here at Vibrant. I'm thrilled to see you all who are here, all of you who are online. Um, welcome. Special shout out to two travelers who came all the way from New Hampshire. It's really awesome. In the era of Zoom, that means um, even more. So a, a couple of preliminaries before I introduce our distinguished guest. Um, this evening is part of a series we call Labyrinth and the Library Live. That is an ongoing collaboration um, that seems to get better with every season between Labyrinth and the Princeton Public Library. Um, so it's a partnership I'm really grateful for. And a thank you also to two other important partners and co-sponsors for tonight the Princeton University Humanities Council and the Department for African American Studies. So my thanks go out to all of them. So the library and the store are pretty good at making sure that our programming doesn't um, conflict for events that might have overlapping audiences. But then <laughs> once in a while, it happens anyway. And today is an example of that. So I wanna be sure that you all know that you can go straight from here home and get on Zoom uh, or if you're on Zoom, just stay on Zoom and um, find the link on the library's uh, events page for a conversation at 8 p.m. Uh, about the idea of prison abolition with Tommy Shelby and uh, James Foreman Jr. So um, that would make a good, difficult and good segue from tonight. Uh, I see that many of you are in fact online and I want to be sure you can participate in the Q&A. You know how to do that. There's a little question mark icon by the chat box. If you click on that and type in your question, we'll see it and we'll try to include as many as we can in the Q&A. So now we're here to celebrate and discuss historian Donald Yacobone's important new book. Here it is, Teaching White Supremacy, America's Democratic Ordeal and the Forging of Our National Identity. The U.S. is haunted by its past and in many ways is still trapped in it. Perhaps the one hopeful thing we can say about this moment is that some of the most oppressive lies this nation tells itself are coming apart, even as they are being repeated. How might we yet be part of a true awakening and an opportunity to begin again? When I learned of Donald Yacobone's work, um, it seemed like a chance to bring him together with Dr. Eddie Glaude, whose time we both begin again centers James Baldwin in the contemporary moment in such an important and resonant way. And I'm very, very happy that they both agreed uh, to be here with us tonight. Donald Yacobone is an associate at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard and a 2013 winner of the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal. His previous book, co-authored with Henry Louis Gates Jr., is The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. And while Dr. Eddie Ball needs no introduction in this room, let me just say that besides being professor and chair of African American Studies here at Princeton, he is one of the foremost public intellectuals in the US who unflinchingly explains America to itself in every available medium, including as of late, a podcast called History is Us. You should check it out. Dr. Glaude's influential books prior to Begin Again, which I just mentioned, include Democracy in Black, a race still enslaves the American soul, and in a shade of blue, pragmatism and the politics of black America. We all know that in April, Governor DeSantis of Florida signed an individual freedom measure, which bans the teaching of many topics related to race, allegedly so as to prevent feelings of guilt and shame among students. And elsewhere too, the educational climate is one in which teachers have been made afraid by state legislatures to teach the history of slavery in America history of the construction and nurturing and justification of white supremacy runs through this nation's textbooks. May we learn from the lessons that Dan Donald Yacobon distills for us from 200 years of history books used in American schools and hold those who are stepping right into that legacy today to account. As David Blight has written about teaching white supremacy, for those, and I quote, for those wondering how we got here, with book bannings, politicized school boards, librarians and arrests, and maddening ignorance about the American past, 
Here is a long view and we make it challenge. Please join me in welcoming our two guests. And thank you all for coming here, uh, both physically and online. I really appreciate it. Dreams of the divine mission of the United States to expand across the continent blazed in the 1873 lithograph variously titled American Progress or Manifest Destiny by the New York publisher and Western travel promoter George A. Crowfoot. It's the image on the cover of the book. The illustration's alluring figure of Columbia with a star of empire on her forehead floats across the landscape, sweeping away indigenous peoples and the wilderness for the expansion of American farms, cities, and railroads. Her left hand clutches the telegraph line, the internet of the 19th century. And her right hand cradles, not the Bible or a digest of laws, but as Crawford wrote, quote, the emblem of education, the school book. Never before or since has any American more graphically unified national identity, white supremacy, and education. Teaching white supremacy explores the origins, development, and perpetuation of the idea of white national identity from the colonial era to the present. I emphasize the many ways education helped promote the concept of whiteness and black inferiority. To thoroughly dominate American culture, it is grounded in the collection of about 3,000 textbooks at the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Monroe C. Gutman Library. It is not, however, a book about a bunch of bad books. <laughs> it is rather an exploration of how American identity came to be defined as white and how it underpins our democratic institutions this day. It also provides some compelling historical background, I think, with the central issues discussed in Professor Glaude's Democracy in Black, explaining why white supremacy has been so tenaciously destructive. If nothing else, the book focuses on the responsibility of Northern cultural leaders and educators for the creation, dissemination, and perpetuation of white supremacy and construction of the color line. For most of our history, scholarship and popular thought have blamed the legacy of Southern slavery for the distressing persistence of racial inequality. And of course, Southern slave owners and their descendants do possess a unique and lethal responsibility for civil war and racial repression. But even if slaves had, ne had never existed in the South, Northern white theorists Religious leaders, intellectuals, writers, politicians, scientists, lawyers, and of course, educators would have invented a lesser race, which is exactly what happened, to build white solidarity and in that way make democratic culture and political institutions possible. The Canadian born 19th century New Yorker John H. Van Every, the nation's first professional racist and the subject of chapter two, epitomized the influence of Northern thinkers on the subject of white supremacy. For Van Every, people of African descent embodied an inferior species of human designed by God and nature to do the white man's work. He argued that the African presence united white interests and made the growth of American democracy possible which could and could not have occurred otherwise. As the novelist Toni Morrison explained, in the United States, the rights of man, quote, was inevitably yoked to Africanism. In other words, American democracy depended upon black inequality to sustain white equality. Such instincts infused American education from the outset. Noah Webster of dictionary fame in 1843 asserted that, quote, that, the, that of the woolly haired Africans who constitute the principal part of the inhabitants of Africa, 
There is no history, and there can be none. That race has remained in barbarism from the first ages of the world. James Baldwin, the celebrated African-American author and social critic, in 1965 affirmed the impact of such beliefs, recalling that, quote, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither had I. I was a savage about whom the least said the better, who had been saved by Europe and who had been brought to America. This was, educators taught him, quote, an act of God. You belong where white people put you. And it always had been so. An African American student in the 1920s had asked the teacher why no black people had appeared in his history, excuse me, history textbook. The answer would be that African Americans, quote, had done nothing to marry. As the black scholar Charles H. Wesley reported in 1925, through textbooks and classroom instruction, the black student quickly realized, quote, that his badge of color in America is a sign of subjugation, inferiority, and contempt. In 1939, the NAACP surveyed popular American uh, history textbooks and as one student concluded from the association's findings, since textbooks drill white supremacy, quote, into the minds of growing children, I see how hate and disgust is motivated against the American Negro. Thomas Maitland Marshall's 1930 textbook embodied the ideals, assumptions, and aims that characterized most history textbooks published before the 1970s. The very first page, right below the title, in big capital letters, the story of the white man. As so many other 20th century textbooks inculcated, Marshall taught that, quote, Negro of plantation days was usually happy. He was fond of the company of others and liked to sing, dance, crack jokes, and laugh he admired bright colors and was proud to wear a red or orange bandana. He was never in a hurry and always ready to let things go until tomorrow. Most planters, he asserted, learned that loyalty based on pride, kindness, and rewards, not the whip, brought the best returns. I can't tell you how many textbooks repeated this stuff over and over. Before the 1970s, the overwhelming majority of American textbooks began with Marshall's assumption that the history of the United States was the history of the white man. The struggles against Native Americans, which they usually refer to as red savages, and his need to control African Americans. As the 1918 text explained, whatever non-English people had done to create the United States, quote, and this was in italics in the original, the forces that have shaped that life have been English, and only English, an idea that Emerson had glorified in his own 1856 study, English Traits. Most presented African Americans variously, that is most textbooks, variously as a foreign repellent element, an unwanted presence, a necessary evil or a threat, and always, as one 1914 textbook asserted, quote, a problem that it took many years to solve. In the 1940s through the 1960s, John D. Hicks, one of the era's most influential professors at the University of California at Berkeley, solved, quote, the problem in his textbooks by asserting that anything beyond vocational training for African Americans was a waste of time. And he said that. He mocked their, quote, pathetic eagerness for education, asserting that they showed, quote, no great proficiency beyond the elementary. Thus, Northern white children learned that, quote, Negroes were unfit to rule. It had been a terrible mistake, textbooks proclaimed, to prevent the intelligent white people from governing after the Civil War. Authors assured readers that, quote, men of intelligence and property will not submit to the rule of the ignorant very long. 
as Professor Marshall had concluded, and these are his words, white robes and fiery crosses had the desired results. While the worst features of our textbooks have been eliminated, the problem that James Baldwin had identified in the 1960s remains. Teachers from Florida to Vermont and west to Washington, the state of Washington, staged damaging, quote, slave auctions in their classroom, what one black Vermont parent rightly labeled curricular violence. The influential New York Times journalist Charles Blow explained that when he was young, quote, I was led to believe blackness was inferior. We had been trained in it, bathed in it, acculturated to hate ourselves. At every turn, at every moment, I was being baptized in a narrative that everything white was right, good, noble, and beautiful, and everything black was not. The bitter influence lay everywhere, he wrote, even in the blue-eyed white Jesus hanging over your bed. The experience of black high school students in my own Boston suburb in 2020 reinforced Lowe's view. A local branch of the NAACP, along with high school students, protested school curriculum and the punishments handed out to African-American students. I am not going to lie, one female student cried. Going to high school made me hate being black. At the beginning of this very month, a Texas middle school teacher told his class, which included African-American students, that quote, and these are the teacher's words, deep down in my heart, I'm ethnocentric, which means I think my race is the superior one. Despite the monumental outburst of thoughtful and determined scholarship, scholarship, excuse me, since the mid-1960s, the way we teach history in the public schools remains as lifeless as John Brown's body. But clearly, slavery and race, as Professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries wrote, isn't in the past, it's in the headline. However taught in school, history is far from a dead thing. We carry it with us, James Baldwin memorably remarked in his essay, The White Man's Guilt. We are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways. And history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise since it is to history that we owe our frame of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all for, for coming. Dorothea, thank you for your visionary leadership and the way in which you uh, Lay labyrinth books for a uh, gathering space, um, even uh, in the context of, of, of ravages of COVID, places a special place. And so, thank you. I want to thank the library um, and others. It's an honor to be in conversation with you about uh, this important book. So, let me begin with a question How in the hell? Did you decide to write such a book? Give us a description of what was going on in Widener Library <laughs> to lead you to write this. Well, uh, this, this is a question which uh, I've been dealing with since the very beginning. Uh, it was important to me because I um, quickly realized, once I got deep into the research in this, that there were uh, many people out there who would see me, in fact, I've already been accused of being a, a closet Marxist, um, a, a slave to Howard Zinn, and that accounts for my, uh, you know, would, would account for why I wrote this book. Well, all that, of course, is nonsense. Uh, in fact, I didn't even intend to write this book. I was deep into another project on the uh, on public memory, the abolitionist movement, 
and the creation of the civil rights movement. And I had spent uh, a couple months at uh, the Houghton Library, which is the library at Harvard that contains the manuscript collections, letters from all kinds of authors, professors, politicians, everything. And I had um, gone through the papers of John J. Chapman, who appears in chapter six <laughs> in, this, in this book. 55 boxes of his letters, and I decided that after I finished it, I needed to take a break because I had a mountain of additional correspondence to go through from the uh, family of William Lloyd Garrison, the uh, founder of the radical anti-slavery movement. There are thousands of family letters that uh, I, his, his children and the people they married and, and their children uh, were very active in creation of the modern civil rights movement at the turn of the century. So anyway, I, I thought, well, my head hurts. I want to go <laughs> go over to the uh, School of Education on the, on the Harvard campus and go to the uh, Monroe C. Guffman Library. Uh, I figured they probably had some textbooks and I'll you know, select a few, just look at them, see what they say about the abolitionist movement, get back to work. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. I was confronted with a collection, and physically, they were in a special collections uh, room. I was confronted by 3,000 textbooks. And my eyes popped out of my head, and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> I didn't expect this. I didn't know what to expect. So, I decided, uh, well, I had, to, I had to start somewhere. So I pulled out of a, a volume. Now the collections, I think the first book in that collection starts at 1800 and goes into the 1980s. I selected a textbook, <laughs> just by chance. Uh, it was published in 1832 and I chose that because that was the year after the emergence of the Liberator and, and Garrison and the Radical Abolitions. Turned out, by Noah Webster. <laughs> and uh, now, you know, as a scholar and a historian, I, I of course, had read the historiography of the abolitionist movement, the coming of the Civil War in the 19th century, going all the way back uh, to those eras. But I hadn't spent much time reading textbooks. Why would I? Um, and the fact that but, well, in the case of, of um, Webster's book and all the ones that I looked at afterwards, it became so profoundly obvious, as I quoted that one from 1930, that what they were really writing about, what they were openly confessing was not history so much, but whiteness and how important it was. And, I, and it occurred to me, wait, I said, well, wait. These are books for children. These aren't scholars, these are books for children. They are deliberately aiming this ideology of whiteness at 10 year old, eight year old, seven year old. And the more books I looked at, again, beginning in 1832 and moving up, I, it, a, a power, a sense, a veil, something descended on me and said, Donald, you got to stop what you're doing and write a different book. Now, I don't do that. That's not something I ever do. This is my ninth book. You start a project it, it, and you go through it, you finish it. But, and I was deep. In fact, I had gotten a fellowship to, to do research. I had been at the Mass Historical Society, the Boston Athenaeum, the Open Library, but of course, wider. But there is just something overwhelming in the message that I was seeing in these books that I had to do it. Now, this was before Trump was president. There was no, the, the issues of whiteness wasn't in the popular press yet. It would soon be there. Uh, but I made these decisions before the politics of this became obvious. So we're going to, obviously, the arc of the conversation land us with moms from Liberty land us in a conversation about what's going on with 
with Yunkin in Virginia, what's happened in South Carolina, what's happening in Texas, what's happened, I just heard in Hopewell. Um, but we're gonna get to that. So the presentist, you know, relevance of this history is 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 pressing. But I want I want us to get a better sense, I want you to give us a better sense of this historical arc. Because most of us know about the lost cause. And most of us know about what redemption meant, how it translated itself into the kinds of stories that were told. Uh, uh, but you mentioned Noah Webster. You pulled out 1832. Um, we know late 19th century, even a little bit earlier, Anglo-Saxonism and how it's justifying America's imperial ambition and, and the like. So the anchor of the book, of course, is that period. But then there's what's what happens before leading up to it and what happens afterwards. Talk a little about a bit about this early period and then set the stage for this character, John H. Van mm -hmm. Every, Every yeah. who everyone needs to know about because he 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 is a a figure that it is is so central to much of what we're hearing today. Yeah, there is a consistency in the issues from the colonial early colonial period right through to, and uh, there are a number of figures um, I, I could emphasize that ever clearly being uh, one of them. But I want to go back even earlier. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to Samuel Sewell, who some of you may. Uh, Remember that name? He was the judge at the Salem Witchcraft Trials. Okay. Now, in many ways, he is symbolic of uh, what comes to grip Northern American culture. Okay. He wrote the first anti-slavery pamphlet in American history. The first anti-slavery pamphlet, The Selling of Joseph, came out in 1700. He denounced slavery as unchristian, uh, the slave trade as a barbaric practice, and he wanted slavery ended. He figured, well, so much. He confessed in his own diary. And, uh, and, and in his letters, that uh, despite the fact that he wrote this pamphlet, just about nobody read it, of the people he knew in colonial Massachusetts, everyone rejected his uh, condemnation of slavery. What he learned was that no one wanted African American, free African Americans. They needed to be controlled. They could not tolerate the idea of African Americans in colonial America uh, free and out of control. Furthermore, he was, he described African Americans despite damning the institution of slavery, keep this in mind, despite that, he described the person of African descent as being like extravasive blood. That is blood that exists outside the regular veins and capillaries of the body politic. That's the way he understood people of African descent. They were, as John H. Van Every would argue uh, in the next century, uh, a people designed by nature and God to do the white man's work. Sewell was so obsessed with this concept of race, which was just being developed. Remember that race is a, 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 a sociological construct. Uh, it isn't science, although people presented it as science. Uh, and it hadn't been really developed yet until later in the 18th century. And so he sees people of African descent as being inferior, as being unassimilatable into the culture. 
And it so concerned him that he wrote in his diary that he wondered if he would keep his whiteness, quote, after the resurrection. Those are his words. Really early for that kind of reflection, historically, right? Yeah, it's early. <laughs> Although uh, there are plenty of examples. There are examples of uh, Captain John Smith, who people are dyed the wool racist <laughs> from, the, from the very outset. Uh, however, uh, when you look at the, the history of Africans in, uh, in Europe, uh, the, the, the situation is very unclear because there are very positive assessments. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, sanctified Af people of African descent. Uh, in England, um, there were many uh, people of African descent who lived freely, uh, worked like anyone else, uh, and the attitudes were contradictory. There was no um, unified view as we would get from people like Sewell. This is a process that is building beginning in the 17th century. And you remember that prior uh, to American colonization, uh, the colonization of, of, of America, North America, uh, the, the, the Europeans had already participated in the slave trade for 100 years. So by the time uh, English colonized uh, North America, the North American coast, uh, they had already experienced 100 years of seeing Africans as slaves. So, so we get to talk a little bit about George Bancroft. Because he's so important. Well, well, he is. And uh, Bancroft, um, and there are, uh, uh, there's another group of this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, in fact, when, when I was first doing this, uh, I thought, well, there seems to be a war going on here. Right? Well, it isn't quite that way. What happens is, is that after the American Civil War, the impact of, of abolition and the attempt to re, recreate the United States on a, on a uh, platform of, of, true, of true equality, uh, the radical reconstruction, did take hold in many textbooks. Uh, not nearly enough. But uh, they exist simultaneously with these other more derogatory ones that uh, you know, we've been talking about. Uh, but uh, after the Civil War, there's a clear change taking place. Unfortunately, it doesn't last. Uh, you have people like Charles Carlton Coffin, who I discovered doing this, who had been uh, the North's most famous war reporter during the Civil War. He wrote a series of textbooks to uh, glorify the, the, the true idea of liberty as born in Europe and uh, planted into the American colonies, and it was now finally bearing fruit after the Civil War with the destruction of slavery. He was a complete equalitarian, rare, <laughs> rare at this period. But there were a few others, Thomas Wentworth Dickinson, who had uh, commanded the first South Carolina volunteers, a black unit, black union unit, wrote a textbook that was used throughout the South. Uh, George Bancroft, the famous uh, 19th century historian, uh, damned slavery. Uh, because he didn't uh, write about Reconstruction, <laughs> we don't know entirely what his thoughts would have been. But this is also something I found uh, in later textbooks. Uh, even historians who damned slavery approved of abolitionists, but when the story got to Reconstruction, the whole thing turned around. And Reconstruction was an evil that placed, as I had read, uh, you know, my big beginning remarks had put the so-called ignorant Negro in charge. It was a travesty uh, to white people. And suddenly, the real tragedy of Reconstruction uh, 
end of the Civil War wasn't the history of African Americans, it was the tragedy of white people who had to suffer the rule of Africa. This is, it, it's horrifying to think of, but this dominated the teaching of American history right into the 1960s, late 1960s. So we jumped a bit when I introduced Bancroft, I jumped over a whole bunch. Just go back to, to John H. Van, Van Avery. For, yeah, for a second. Second. Oh, which sure. is so important. Yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my remarks, Van, Van Every was uh, what, we, what George uh, Fredrickson called first professional racist. Uh, he had been, he was, he was, he was Canadian born, and I'm getting more northern than that. Uh, and he, he uh, migrated to New York, became a physician uh, and a Democrat capital D, a part of the Democratic Party uh, prior to the Civil War. The party of Andrew Jackson, uh, only he was in the North. And uh, because there's no biography of him yet, we don't know what the factors were that changed, that, that influenced him. That, I don't want to say changed, but influenced him. But uh, by the time he starts uh, uh, writing in the 1840s, he's already contacting people like John C. Calhoun. And he's seeking to unite the North and the South, 1840s, long before the Civil War, to unite the North and the South on the basis of uh, the suppression of African Americans. All right, in the 1840s. He participated, as a physician, he joins um, the Union Army uh, during the Mexican War and serves it, comes back uh, and abandons his wife. I'm sorry, uh, uh, his wife dies uh, in, in, in New York and abandons his daughter to his in-laws. And as far as I can tell, never sees her again. He's in Rochester. Rochester, New York, which is, of course becomes the home of who? Frederick Douglass. Boy, <laughs> uh, I was hoping for a war between the two, but I never found uh, the evidence. I think Van Every left before Douglass showed up. Um, in any event, he goes to Washington, D.C. Uh, and starts writing in for um, public newspapers um, against what we would call African-American rights and in defense of the South and slavery. Uh, and slave traders, oh, God. He even, uh, there was a uh, famous um, trial of a, uh, slaver who had been captured because of the, the uh, as you know, the slave trade was declared illegal in 1808. He was captured and tried uh, in New York City. And Van Every's position was, you shouldn't try him. You should be giving him a medal. He's saving people in Africa and bringing them into the United States to uh, gain civilization. He was a hero. Well, uh, Van Every went on to uh, publish uh, two newspapers and, and created a, little, a small publishing empire in the heart of Manhattan. Uh, a weekly and a monthly newspaper, countless pamphlets, and several major works, many of whom were quoted not just in state legislatures, but in Congress. Even Abraham Lincoln read John H. Van Every. And the more time passes, the more uh, Van Every uh, becomes a virtual household word because uh, he's a genius at marketing. And he places advertisements for his repulsive publications in every single Democratic capital D newspaper in the country. And in one year, published advertisements in 1,400 different newspapers. People in England knew who he was. He was recognized as a, quote, expert in the African-American. Um, and uh, he went on, um, after the, uh, the Civil War, he began to argue that slavery did not exist. Yeah. 
Slavery was something that white people had done to other white people in ancient times. And he argued this because according to Van Everett, um, God and nature designed different species of humans. Just as though, just like there were different species of birds, there were different species of animals. And to Van Every's mind, the eagle and the owl, those are the two birds he liked to pick on, uh, well, yes, they were birds, but the eagle was clearly the superior one and the, and the owl the inferior one. What was the same with humans, according to Van Every? And that God and nature had created an inferior species of human, the African American from the African rather, um, to do the white man's work. He wasn't a slave. He was doing what God and nature intended, just like sheep and cows do what they do. Africans did this work. They were not slaves. And they were being rescued from Africa by, by, <laughs> by white slave traders and brought to America to learn a trade and to learn uh, civilization. And some of his literatures. And his literature, sorry, John, his, his literature was read by uh, lost cause advocates after the Civil War. Uh, and in fact, in doing this book, it, it, for those who venture off and want to read it, you'll find out that uh, lost cause ideology uh, actually started in the North, not in the South. And this is a really critical point in the book. It's yeah. so one of the through lines in the book that you know Southern exceptionalism, right. uh, where we displace our national sins onto that region yeah. and think of the North as a treasure of virtue, right? Uh, yeah, you know, is is in fact a misconception. And as Malcolm X says, as long as you're south of the Canadian border, you're south. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you want you show very clearly. Right, how the North participated in the production of yeah. this ideology. Uh, every, every I, I use examples, uh, Dan Every being the most prominent, gets a whole chapter, but in the first chapter, I lay all this out. Uh, just pick the contours figure. of white supremacy. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, just pick a, a, a figure, uh, whether it's uh, Horace Mann, the great education leader, uh, uh, lifelong colonizationist, uh, Horace Mann. Uh, you know, literature, science, uh, well, Emerson, Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman's one of the worst. It's just, it's, it's really tough to swallow. It. But the point of all this is uh, to show uh, that this is an American problem. This isn't a Southern problem. This is an American problem. This is, uh, and the ideas that we are still grappling with were as were formed really in the North more than the South. And that, it, that the institution of slavery didn't have to exist as such uh, to create what um, the North valued, and that is a, a, you know, a democracy founded on whiteness. Now, there's an example. Um, in 1954, I think it was, um, oh, it was in his name. Uh, Gordon Alport was a Harvard professor of sociology, uh, very famous at, his, at the time in the 50s. And he wrote a book on prejudice. And, <coughs> excuse me, he interviewed a lot of Americans throughout the country. And he cites one example of a five year old girl. He or one of his researchers, um, and uh, they would. He was doing this to, to assess white northern attitudes about prejudice and, and the prejudice against African Americans. And uh, he would so he engaged this young lady, this young girl, uh, in a conversation, and discovered that she was upset. She was terribly upset that the that it may have been the only African American family in town. Uh, was moving, leaving, and she was upset by this. But he said, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. What, why are you upset? Five-year-old girl. Well, 
Now, this family, this black family is leaving, there's no one who were better than. So, Northern uh, culture is acculturating children from the very beginning of life. The very beginning. Five-year-old isn't even in school yet. So, tracking these school, these school books, these texts, right, gives us a sense of how uh, American children are socialized into a certain way of seeing themselves and seeing the world. Um, I grew up on the coast of Mississippi. Um, I remember in middle school taking a history course with my favorite teacher, Miss Mitchell, who stood on a box because she was like four foot two. <laughs> she had lost her voice because she was a singer and she, she had a microphone. And she taught the Civil War in a riveting way. But I came out of her class thinking that Stonewall Jackson was my hero. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Robert E. Lee became a national. But, but I thought yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that Stonewall Jackson was my hero. And so, and here I am in 2022. And so there's a sense in which you tell the story about these, the enduring legacy of these these schools. But you don't say that they, but they, they were answered. I mean, you tell the story in the last chapter of the right. book, yes. Renewing the Challenge, about how African Americans responded to, the, to, this, uh, to, to, to this effort. Uh, you talk about the importance of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction written in 1935, yeah. even as folk weren't paying attention to it, right? And the ways in which that book set the stage in so many ways for what Donald Franklin would write in 1947. And like, so talk about that challenge, and then we're going to move really quickly, because I know we got to get to questions. Well, talk about that really quickly. Because <laughs> one of the things we want to do is you do say there's an answer. It's not just both just sitting back. But it, well, this, this whole thing is also personal. Okay, It's also personal. Because while I was doing this research, uh, the, the librarians were really wonderful. They that they closed the basement off in, in the library, and they, they they sort of booted everybody out because they were going to redesign the, the the library. Anyway, so they gave me an office up on the second floor, and they brought. I I got about halfway through these this collection of three thousand, and they brought them up on carts to the second floor. Okay, so I go through you know like the three uh, the two sides of the cart and uh, three shelves. And I go through it, I finished it, they bring up the next card, et cetera, et cetera. But one day, it was, I, I was at my desk here, you know, writing away and reading, and I turned around to look at the new card that had just come up. My eyes were drawn instinctively to this one book right in the middle of this card. I don't know why. My eyes aren't what they used to be, so I couldn't read the title. But somehow, it, it was almost as if it, was, as if it throbbed. I know, it sounds weird. <laughs> I know, it is true. So I said, why, what is this? I reached over, picked it up. It was my social studies book from fifth grade. <laughs> In it, it, it didn't mention anything about the abolitionist movement. It said nothing about it. It just said that some people didn't like slavery, blah, blah, blah. And then it said, but who else would do the work? Who else would do the work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, this, that, so this is a personal thing as well as an academic. It affects all of us today, me growing up. And so here we are. I'm going to come to you now. With, with opening it up for questions. In the middle of Black Lives Matter, suddenly there was, a, there was this, um, an effort to tell a different story. In the middle of Black Lives Matter, in which people were organizing against police violence, suddenly Robert Lee statues came down in Charlottesville, in New Orleans, across the South. There was an insistence on uh, telling a fuller story immediately 
Not only did we see in the did we see in the context of the debates around immigration, voter suppression, the stories we told. Right? I see a direct relationship between voter suppression, immigration debates, Jan 6, and critical race theory debates. The story we tell. Glenn Youngkin gets elected governor of, of Virginia by touting parental rights. Wokeism mm -hmm. has gone too far. They are tainting our children, right. making them feel guilty about themselves. What does this book have to say to that, which we are in the middle of now? Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is the answer as to why they're doing, it. they're doing it. It is because we have created an identity, an American identity of whiteness. And beginning with Barack Obama's election, American identity is now threatened. We have been writing about, we have been creating this for 300 years. People have become accustomed to the, these assumptions of what a true American is and a true and the best form of human. Now suddenly the world is changing. We are a multiracial country and soon people of European descent will be just one of a number of minority groups. People can't take this. Now, not all. 45% maybe, <laughs> right? 75 million? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's jump, open it up to some questions. Here we go. Yeah, can I take that and you share that? No, please, just stand. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll, come, I'll come to you with the mic so that everyone can. Hi, I'm Jeff Grant. I, I can't hear you late, I apologize, but I just heard some remarks about the best human. You refer to the best human. It seems somewhat subjective to me about what that is. Can you tell me what you mean about the best human? What is that person? What is that thing? Well, uh, you, 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 because you, you, you came in late, you missed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, what this book has, has uh, attempted to do is to look at the way uh, Americans from the colonial period to the present have identified um, American identity. And key to that identity is, in fact, uh, the African presence. Because uh, the African presence um, creates, in the minds of people of European descent, a, a um, a unity of purpose which allows democracy to flourish. We have to remember that at a time uh, in the 17th and 18th century, democracy was not a value principle. Not a value principle. Um, and uh, democracy was something that was associated with rampant mob violence, mob rule. To legitimize democracy uh, in people's minds. Um, the African presence showed to people of, of uh, European ancestry that the difference between themselves wasn't as great as it was between the so-called inferior. And it created a sense of unity among um, people of European descent. And this is a notion which uh, comes down to us from the very beginning of American culture and is reaffirmed relentlessly in the textbooks, in American history textbooks. And not just American history textbooks, American geography textbooks, political science textbooks, economic textbooks, uh, eugenic textbooks. Uh, chapter six has both of them. Yeah, it sure is. It's horrifying. Okay, just, just to this day and age, like, how would you characterize that current day person? You're going to say, given the history and so forth, the eugenics and the immigrations, or 
How would you characterize someone today that you feel would be a best human? Like, are they? You know, I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I don't create best humans. No. Uh, that, that's not the point. Yeah, I think that I think that's a good answer. Yeah. But for that one, I want to move to the next question back here. Well, not really. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about. Um, so. So your exercise was to look at books and, from a historical perspective, what, what you didn't want to see in them. But as you think about our work going forward, how should we think about ways to define, to measure, to assess sort of the things we want to see in the textbooks of tomorrow? Oh. Like, how do we make sure they capture? Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I understand. One of the powerful uh, tools of white supremacy is absence. Absence. So, and, and this became clear over and over and over again uh, because what textbooks um, included is what the culture is teaching to students about what is important. And if you're not, if something isn't in it, then it is not important. And relentlessly, uh, African Americans were excluded. And if they were included, it was only because they were slaves. And no individuals were ever mentioned. Now, this begins to change in the, in the 1970s, uh, very clearly. Uh, and uh, th there is dramatic improvement compared to what had come before. Uh, are there still problems? Yes. And they're getting worse, as you well know. Um, but inclusion is essential. And not just the, the same individuals, Harriet Tubman, you know, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, and that's, and, and suddenly Afri people of African descent are only important because of the civil rights movement. I'm sorry, they helped build this country, and we wouldn't have this country without the influence and labor of African Americans in, in all fields, all areas of knowledge. But that is not the message that is being given to our students. One way in which I put it is that what we choose to leave out of our stories actually reveals the limits of our conceptions of justice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see? Mm -hmm. What and who we choose to leave out those stories. Yes. Um, we are coming up a little past to the top of the hour, but I want to give time to a question uh, sure. online because I promised we would also pay attention to those, um, which is picking up on the fact that in terms of your sources, there are the textbooks, but you're also a reader of, of letters in the archives and, um, and is asking uh, how historians will do their work in a, uh, in a time where letters are, are falling away. I want to tack yeah. onto that. Yeah. I want to tack onto that as sort of sub question. Um, which it brings us back to, to worrying, uh, as you do, about um, how this, your story carries forward um, from here, and that is, what are the sources we need also to be looking at in order to understand where, in addition to the textbooks, where the cultivation of the ideology of white supremacism uh, yeah. is happening today? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and... Uh, there, there isn't a uh, definitive uh, answer, and the, the point you made about um, manuscript collections and reading them, uh, I only recently, about a month ago, learned that uh, students are no longer being taught to write, mm -hmm. script, yeah. handwriting, it, and <laughs> I thought, wait a minute. I mean, I've made my career out of reading manuscript collections and writing biographies, and, and, and I can't. It's mind boggling. Suddenly, the historical profession is in jeopardy, in, to my mind. Uh, how are you going to write a biography of George Bancroft? Uh, an, an a relatively obscure African American people that I like to write about, people who haven't been written about. Um, if you can't read their handwriting, what are you going to do? I, 
th this is an existential crisis that I I don't know what the answer uh, to is. But in terms of of what um, we uh, we need to be paying attention to, uh, the, one of the benefits of modern life is the digitizing of newspapers. I can tell you, I, I wrote a, a, a biographical essay on a, on a black artist. I couldn't have done it without digitized newspapers. I mean, how are you going to know there's a reference to a, to a person in a Montana newspaper? You don't look at every newspaper in the country that's ever been published to find, of course, it's ridiculous. It's not impossible. So digitizing is essential. Uh, and the more, uh, more of that that we have, the, the better. And 19th century, 18th century newspapers, uh, there have been countless studies of slave advertisements. All this is possible because of digitizing. So the more of that, that it is essential to retrieve this history that you're referring to. Yes, absolutely. Did you have a closing, any kind of closing? Mm -hmm. closing okay, then uh, we can all join in thanking both of you. for this. Will you sign copies? Oh, sure. um, and maybe Donald can be by the books. And if you want to sign a copy, you can just line up there. And um, thank you for coming. Yeah, they're trying to say that white people are superior to copies. He's not referring to the actual.